Let's begin by taking a deep breath in and letting it out. I encourage you to feel the sensations within your body, your very own living machine. Now, let's think about our planet. One big breathing organism with air circulating, tides shifting, animal kingdoms living in cohesion within a culmination of terrain. The terrain that catches my attention in particular are wetlands, the kidneys of the earth, filled with plants with root structures that have evolved to purify contaminants in water. Now, we drink water every day. Staying hydrated is key. I'm sure we're all drinking clean, purified water, but what if we had miniaturized wetland ecosystems in our homes for our water purification needs? It is possible. Another natural phenomenon that really excites me is the navigation ability of tiny little ants. These ants deposit pheromones, allowing them to retrace their paths, but also allow other insects to know about their whereabouts fostering the sort of collective intelligence between these insects. Now, I don't have my driver's license yet, yet, so I'm really excited by autonomous navigation. These are machines traveling routes in semi-collaboratively crunching numbers. But could an insect's navigational intelligence be harnessed or even collaborated with for greater autonomous navigation? It is possible. We can continue playing this game and we will find countless examples of parallels between living systems and manufactured entities set out to complete similar tasks but deferring in their internal structure. So let's imagine the split worldview. Organisms with a 500 million year head start rooted in evolutionary theory and computation manifested through robotics and technology that I believe is largely inspired by sci-fi. Any robotic being will make optimized, efficient outputs, and any cellular organic being may make more unpredictable ones. One is made out of gears powered by electricity, the other cells and nutrition. This relates closely through a cybernetic law, which relates how a system's internal structure correlates to its external behavior. I call myself a nature and human-centric designer, and I've spent the last couple of years exploring, interrogating, and unraveling my interests within the fields of science and design. My practice speculates a utopia of this biological symbiosis between us and the technology that we interact with every single second. But as I was growing up, I saw this split world view in my living room. I'm so incredibly lucky to be a daughter of two loving parents who were initially trained to be an electrical engineer and a zoologist. And gradually, I found myself working within this intermediary, learning to speak both of their languages. But what exists within this intermediary? To me, it was this magical imaginary, this world filled with omnipresent yet invisible interspecies relationships. Restricted by our human vision, we're often so ignorant to our human entanglements with non-human entities. And yet, from touching or swiping on a screen, there's a transferal of an array of microbial agents. So why do we maintain this split worldview? Throughout our history, our human civilization has been measured by the distance between the built and the natural. For at least 10,000 years, plants have been turned into crops, animals into beasts of burden, and even microorganisms haven't been able to escape. They've been pressed into service as fermenters. Humans, we've been modifying and innovating our environments. But nature is unpredictable. It is full of disruptions. There is no stable, predictable pattern in nature, and yet we collaborated with it and we harnessed it. We have been technologists from the beginning. However, somewhere along our path, we have strained away from creating innately biophilic tools and collaborating with nature and have begun to create complex, part-driven objects instead. The devices that we rely on every single second in their infancy put the people who mine and manufacture them in hazardous health situations. These same devices towards the end of their lives contributed tons of e-waste, 
disbalance water tables and strangle ecosystems, and all of a sudden we return back to the split worldview and we can see obsolescence and decay. The question that I'm so afraid to ask is whether we're gradually being overrun by the same devices that we've created to help us. Over time, I began to convince myself that perhaps it was not technology, but rather the systems in place that have created it. That's the issue. I began to find my role as a designer in interrogating these systems and playing around with the way that technology is designed today. I began this by asking whether matter can be the starting point in creating artificial life. What happens when we change the skin of the robots that we interact with? What happens when this skin is biologized such that it becomes a symphony of pulse, fluid, and sensation? And that is exactly what the Sorb robot explores. And I'll show you more entities just like it. I explored these questions further through creating the Kaidobot, a six-legged or hexapod robot, and its skin is made out of chitin from seafood waste and sodium alginate from seaweed. The Kaidobot can be deployed on any shoreside, and once it's deployed, it begins searching for chitin-based materials. Once it finds it, it collects it and pushes it onto its carpus. But the really intriguing thing about this robot is its speculated materials processing system. Echoing the self-replicating works of John Van Neumann, once the Kaidobot finds enough of these materials, it processes it into a sort of paste in order to grow its own armor and for reproduction, thus creating more Kaidobots. In this system, the robotic skin has been biologized, and its outcome is a greater entropy, and let's take a look at why. The Kaidobot is made out of organic materials, which means it is destined to break down at a fast rate, making it more vulnerable. The Kaidobot may lose a limb or many limbs. It may develop cuts and cracks and repair them. It may grow old, it may wrinkle, it may disintegrate, and it may die, making it unable to move in predictable ways. The Kaidobot is pushing us to embrace a relationship to technology and subsequently to nature by preaching concepts of impermanence through the adoption of this bio-hybrid technology. This is a system that veers away from concepts of planned obsolescence and towards embracing entropy and decay. I've been speaking a lot about systems, and a key part of what upholds it is the way that we talk about it, our linguistic etymology. A perfect example of this is the word robot, derived from the Czech word robota, which means forced labor. The diction itself influences our robotic designs to fulfill purposes of servitude. However, we live in a time where countless resources are being poured into creating more seamless human to robotic interactions, and so shouldn't these robotic entities possess a greater social, emotional, or a natural form of intelligence? Yes, they should. And we called this bio-intelligence. Before we go into bio-intelligence, let's speak a bit about artificial intelligence, which in its infancy was really closely mimicking neurons and neural structures, efficiently breaking down how the brain works into digestible, researchable, assembly line chunks, mathematically simplifying this complex organ. Newer, more complex machine learning technologies have been developed, harnessing the wisdom of the crowd, if you will, weakening this link further. But what if we moved from a nature-inspired to a nature-collaborated world? For far too long, we've ridden horse carriages and directed the horse where to go instead of allowing it to operate from the freedom of its own intelligence. And this freedom is the essence of bio-intelligence. Bio-intelligence is the bio-hybrid brain. It is the fusion of biological and mechanistic elements. We studied bio-intelligence in the context of autonomous cars, and upon our research, we found that each autonomous vehicle processes 40 terabytes of data per hour. That is equivalent to your iPhone's use for 3,000 years. That's a lot of years to be used in one hour. 
Data processing and data storage relies heavily on carbon-emitting data centers, which only accelerates global warming. And so we set out to question whether there's an opportunity for organic, sustainable, data-free navigation. We explored opportunities for this through exploring and collaborating with the Physarium polycephalum or slime mold organism. And through our research, we were able to learn about how it grows, learns, predicts, and adapts. And since we couldn't really fit an autonomous vehicle into our studio, we mimicked it using an autonomous robot and a cardboard maze. When we let this robot run free in the maze, it was able to find the sensor, but it relied solely on its sensors and data processing. It used what's called a flood-filling algorithm, which means it needed to travel every little crevice of the maze in order to learn it and then find its center. When we let the Physarium organism run free in this very same maze, it too was able to find the center but it did not rely on any sensors, any processing, any data storage, or any computation. It did so using its chemo and photo taxi, so its ability to detect chemicals and light. We ultimately collated these findings into this biohybrid system, where we speculate camera vision reading the slime mold's movements in order to inform autonomous navigation. And in this system, the robotic brain has been biologized and the outcome is a greater entropy. And I know what you're all thinking. You know, plugging in cassettes of living Physarium dishes into our Teslas is quite a far fetch. It is. But it does offer a means of autonomous navigation that goes back to our innate biophilic toolmaking and collaborating with nature. It offers an organism to organism interaction that goes through a very familiar media, technology. Within the examples discussed so far, the intent is to move away from blindly pursuing innovation and towards creating living machines that may restore our relationship with nature. And nature, 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 I've been speaking a lot about it, but do we think it's ideal? Why do we move away from it in the first place? Was it urbanization or industrialization? Our industrial revolution brought about a chemical pollution that may be irreversible. However, this wave of biological design may bring a biological pollution that is going to be irreversible. For this reason, it's absolutely critical for us designers and anyone working with living machines to have a thorough knowledge on natural processes, ecology, and organism metamorphosis, just to name a few processes. Essentially, if we understand the organisms that we're working with, we won't have to hurt, edit, or decapitate them. And this brings me to discussing the biopod. The biopod is a living machine that instantiates an ecological process of the wetland ecosystem. It is a flotation device designed to purify water with no synthetically edited organisms, electricity, or chemicals. Through studying its flora, fauna, and organisms present within a wetland, we're able to create a habitat for a miniaturized one to thrive. The biopod is an example of a nature-centric machine that possesses persuasive evolutionary theory, which means it's able to be regenerative, through its ability to perpetuate a long-term circularity. It not only boosts the ecosystem within which it is deployed, but also increases its resilience. We hope to deploy these pods in the spring and fund its future deployment through citizen science. But in this system, the entire system has been biologized and its outcome is a greater entropy. But this biopod is bringing us back to where we started looking at parallels between living systems and manufactured entities, often set out to complete similar tasks, but they do not have to defer in their internal structure. In the systems described today, certain parts of them have been biologized, allowing us to get a greater entropy, which brings us back to our relationship with nature. Let's take a look at how that might be for your morning routine. You wake up and you shower using biologically purified water. Once you're done, you're getting dressed, but your clothes are lined with symbiotic medicinal bacteria. As you're eating your breakfast, you have to feed your phone too, and once you're done, organisms are driving you to work. 
Our current methods of design relies heavily on the paradigms of sciences and engineering that exist today. But this does not have to be a designer's reality. And if it is, it's not too late to change it. This reality begins if we're able to gently unravel our linguistic etymology. And this reality begins if we're able to be conscious and critical of the systems that we rely on from second to second. This reality begins if we're able to move from nature inspired to nature collaborated. And this reality brings about the opportunity to keep our one big breathing organism truly living, a living machine. Thank you.